Welcome to the Star of Grind. So, you guys are going to love tonight. So, the guy that we have tonight is Tom Kozik. He is one of the premier executives in the digital space. He's got amazing experience at legacy companies such as Microsoft, Yahoo, Atari. He's launched every kind of, you know, gaming startups he's doing. And he's right now the, the leader of Context Digital Media. So, let's bring him up to the stage. Tom, why don't you come on down? Can we get the Bears game on this thing? Uh, yeah. Bears! And yes, donations are welcome. If any of you want to be featured, it's just five bucks for, uh, for you to bribe your way up here. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we muscled this into place just for you. Living room set here. So, Sam, how are you? So, okay, so first of all, there's a lot of amazing, I've known Tom for a little while. Um, I used to produce a TV show called This Week in Social Media, and I met Tom when we were doing a thing about social gaming. How many of you guys are active in the gaming space right now? Are you anybody developing apps? Okay, pay attention, because so, tonight's going to be a clinic. But first, we kind of want to, every time we do one of these, we always like to meet the man behind the company. So tell me a little bit about, okay, where are you born? Where did you grow up? Um, let's see. Born and raised in Chicago, first generation of my family to walk upright, let alone have opposable thumbs. Um, <laughs> finish high school, uh, go to college. Um, the um, I was a geek from the earliest days. I wanted to be the next Jacques Cousteau. Uh, eighth grade teacher uh, was moving into the high school next door and going to teach data processing. Told me I'm taking it, whether I liked it or not. Uh, two years later, I'm teaching a uh, class, um, Chicago Board of Education, you know, I'm an assistant teacher and uh, writing 360 mainframe assembler code, you know, uh, we built a, I won the 1978 City Science Fair in Chicago for a mainframe multiplayer Star Trek simulation, yeah. Terminal to Terminal, written in assembler. <laughs> and, um, so, uh, so that was that and, uh, you know, well, like I said, first generation, you know, finish high school, let alone, you know, we didn't open college. I'm literally sitting in the, in the guidance counselor's office asking where the test scores want to go. And uh, I said, you know, what's that pretty school up on the lake? Is it Northwestern? Yeah, that's the one. We still my scores there, too. I didn't know. Um, end up trying to uh, get a military uh, ROTC scholarship and uh, go through the testing. They call me back. Say, yeah, take some more tests. You did really well. Come back, take some more tests. Next thing I know, I'm sitting in a movie out of a, an office out of a Spielberg movie. Gray, nondescript steel office, guy in a gray, nondescript polyester suit. Son, have you ever considered your career in intelligence? So my one claim to fame is um, John Roberts, a screenwriter, and uh, he also uh, produces the show Leverage right now with Dean Devlin. Um, John's homage to me was I am represented by three kids in the uh, first Transformers movie who were the three interns from the NSA. And I always want to ask him, which part of my personality is the hot Australian chick, and which part is the angry young black kid? You know, but, um, yeah, so I got this gig at, uh, at the NSA, and we were building, uh, you know, if the, back in the day, kit computers. Wait, so how old are you when you were, yeah, I don't know 18. if any of you guys, like, he kind of glossed over that, but Tom used to be an intern for the National Security Agency. And he, uh, at the age of 18, you said? Yeah, yeah, so right out of, right out of high school. Um, so they... Um, we were, were in D.C. or were you? Yeah, well, so okay. in Maryland. I can't tell you where the location was. It'd be super. No, it's uh, <laughs> just uh, just north of uh, D.C., south of Baltimore, along the, the BW Turnpike, exit 38, um, just off to the left in, in the woods. The um, But the NSA was uh, really wild. I mean, you'd, you'd order something, you know, like government bureaucracy or any of you who worked in a corporation, you know, you got to go through the process and order stuff and fill out forms and everything else. Here it was, yeah, I need some more terminals. And the next day, a pallet shows up. No paperwork, nothing. I, mean, I love that. So we decided we wanted to put ourselves in every air traffic control tower in the world. And the uh, it turned out that the Soviets, in their infinite wisdom, had devised this really cool system that was absolutely paranoid and reported back the air position by radio from every tracking station back to Moscow, which did the same thing in Beijing, which did the same thing in Hanoi, which did the same thing in Pyongyang, and on and on and on. So we... Um, once we figured out how to break that code, we could literally dial in and put ourselves in an air traffic control tower. The cool thing was we built it around a kit computer, which was back in those days, 
you know, if any of you've ever seen the old legendary Byte magazine covers with the first IMSA that Bill Gates and Paul Allen got all inspired by, we, um, we built it with a kit computer from uh, uh, HP and, um, you know, wired this stuff together and, you know, you had it when it, you had it booted by going around flipping the switches. So I got, I got old school credit, you know. But okay, so basically you're Matthew Broderick from that one movie where he builds. No, no, no. He actually, he actually started the war. I never did that. I never pulled a big button. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so obviously, like a lot of your career is focused around gaming. Where did the transition come from? You know, development, building computers right. into the gaming space. So, um, leave NSA. Uh, had my first startup, uh, consulting company, Connections Digital Media, back in uh, Chicago. Just you know, doing D-based consulting back in uh, the, the 80s. Uh, Ashton Tate was here in Los Angeles in Culver City. They uh, caught wind of me, and um, I ended up coming out and becoming the product manager on D-base for a number of years. Um, while I'm here, Microsoft and Ashton Tate have this joint venture around database technology. Microsoft didn't really have anything in the database space. And uh, I got traded like a free agent and ended up going to um, Microsoft where uh, the very first conversation I had was interesting. They said, well, you know, we just signed this deal with all the Japanese consumer electronics companies who are putting, um, you know, a lot of data on these shiny silver disks called CD-ROMs. And we want to know, you know, how can we do that? You know, how can we make that interactive? What will we do? So um, because I came from a data set, they said, oh, great, do that. So we started the Multimedia Systems Group, and this is back when you, had a, when you would buy Windows, then you had to buy a separate pack to make Windows actually play video or play audio. It was an add-on you had to buy, and Windows wouldn't natively do it. So we did that, we did some of the first interactive CD-ROMs, of course, which naturally led to them being games. And um, then I drifted out of that, was in the operating system group for a while, and then back into it, Nathan Mirbold, uh, he was chief scientist at Microsoft at the time. Now he, um, you know, he's kind of a patent troll, but I, I liked him back in the day. But they've got, um, they, he created the interactive consumer technology group, and we were gonna invent interactive TV, and I was uh, Microsoft's first liaison to the film and television community here in, in New York. Um, and uh, I, my one last claim to fame it was Microsoft about seven and a half years. And um, I, I'm not good with the politics. You know, most entrepreneurs, most startup guys and women, you're, you know, we're, we're, we're cut from that cloth. We don't like the slimy politics of slithering up the corporate ladder. I was never good at it. So um, my high watermark came when Bill was off getting married and I had to stand in for him on the stage here at UCLA with Al Gore when he famously invented the internet. And um, so, you know, for, you know, I bought every copy of the New York Times the next day I could possibly find because there was my picture, me and the vice president shaking hands. It was very, very lovely. But um, I figured at that point, my career is never gonna get me better at Microsoft. So, yeah, I guess I'm not, I'm not cut from that, you know, the political cloth. So I left, formed another startup. Uh, this was Mindshare Media to go in and help all these studios and networks that I was walking in as Microsoft and, you know, having guys like Eisner slam the door in my face because I didn't bring a $20 million check for Epcot. And they wanted Microsoft really in there. Um, but they all needed help figuring out what this interactive TV thing was going to be. And, oh yeah, that Mosaic thing just launched recently and that may turn into something. You've got to keep an eye on that. So we ended up building massive properties for Discovery Channel Online, Paramount, uh, you know, uh, Speed Vision, which is now Speed TV, Outdoor Life. Um, some work for National Geo, some stuff for Warner Brothers. And because of you know the early days of the web, we were looking for interactivity, so everything I started end up making turned out to be a lot of gaming uh, technology or gaming approaches and gaming mechanics in a lot of these things, which brought me drifting back into that. Fast forward a few years through some, uh, uh, after I sold my share of my share uh, off to another investment group, I ended up getting airdropped in as you know mercenary CEO or COO at a lot of companies. Um, I stumble across these two guys who are li literally living in their parents' basement in Finland, in Tampere, Finland, hanging out all night, playing Counter-Strike, getting trashed on vodka, and they decide that they don't like this little piece of software coming out of a company down here in Orange County called GameSpy. And GameSpy had a tool called GameSpy Arcade, and it would let you think of it as Xbox Live for PC to PC um, gaming uh, matchups and find a, ser find a server and find people to play with. The um, It became bloatware, it was filled with ads, it got kind of kind of messy. Um, so what ended up happening is I get to, uh, I had these two kids who had built a kick-ass competitor to it. One of the guys who was at, formerly at GameSpy get, got tossed. Um, he calls me up and says, let's go, let's go work with these kids. They have no presence with the publishers in the US. One thing leads to another. We start a company with them. We're going to be the US arm. They get the European arm. Um, about a month into, two months into, we find out they really don't want to do any work. 
they want to sit and play Counter Strike and drink alcohol. Anymore. <laughs> so I uh, I flew them over to L.A. Um, put them on a beach, put them on the beach, wined and dined them on In and Out Burgers, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for three days straight. That's all they wanted to eat. They didn't want to eat anything else. Once they discovered In and Out Burgers, that was it. So um, you know, after that, they were willing to sign any deal I put in front of them, and uh, so we ended up buying the company, and. Um, we were doing a roll-up, we were going to get a bunch of other uh, game technology middleware companies put together. Uh, we started going for strategic money, uh, the VCs all told us, you know, go get, go get a big company like CNET or somebody to invest in this. That would be a good, a good mark of, uh, of endorsement and a good uh, validation. So we started having those discussions and one thing led to another and suddenly everybody started to say, well, we'll just buy you right now. And uh, as an entrepreneur, you should learn one thing, eat when fed, because you never know when the next meal is coming. And, um, the, uh, so the deal wasn't perfect, but it was damn good. So we took the deal, went in, ran Yahoo Games for a few years, and um, then back out into the startup world again. I've had five startups, and like I like to say, two successful exits, and three really good lessons. <laughs> <laughs> which do you think are, uh, which stick with you, the good lessons or the good exits? Because you're lessons. driving the good, the good exits. The good lessons, yeah. The, 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 it's amazing how fast you can spend the money from the good exits. Um, but the good lessons stick with you forever. And, um, you know, more mercenary work for a while in there. And then Nolan Bushnell, who was the founder of Atari, old friend By of mine. I, I don't know if you all noticed this, but the cufflinks. Atari cufflinks. Yeah, yeah I, I, I know you're going to beat me at any poker game that I try to do, but I'm going to find a way to win those off you at some point. In our... Give it your best shot. The, um, <laughs> so uh, we, um, Nolan and I are old friends. Uh, well, he's the older friend. The, uh, he's, you know, I think. 150 or something like that. By now. Thousand. But um, so you know, it's amazing. I did a um, I did a, um, an event down in Australia a couple of years ago, right after we did the deal with Atari, and uh, people were asking about Nolan in you know very deferential tones. Like, oh, he started the video game industry, you know, right after the dinosaurs died, and uh, <laughs> the um, and then he started Chuck E. Cheese. So every parent in America hates this man. The uh, uh, but. It's amazing. Here's, you know, Nolan is one of those those amazing people who, despite the fact that he's really up there in years, you think you're talking to another 22, 23 year old. He's the brain never stops. I want his drugs. I don't know what he's taken, but I gotta get more of them. So um, Nolan came to me with the harebrained scheme of, um, well, I, I just um, helped Big Point enter the U.S. Big Point was NBC's big uh, multiplayer gaming investment. Um, if any of you remember the movie Pulp Fiction. Um, for about 10 years, a uh, window there, I was the Mr. Wolf of the game industry. You know, when something went to shit, you know, I didn't, really, I didn't look as good as Harvey Keitel, but I would get, you know, come in and help clean stuff up. You look way better than Harvey Keitel. Bless you, I'll pay another five later. <laughs> so, um, what is happening is, uh, Nolan comes to me and says, let's buy Atari. Okay, sure, why not? Because uh, we knew a few investment banks that were interested in looking for big deals, and, uh, Atari had been, you know, it changed hands you know, so many times and, and it was a mess. And we had a plan for cleaning it up because they didn't have anything in the mobile, online, or social gaming space. And yet, if you think about it, Atari invented casual gaming. I mean, that was all they were, were simple puzzle and arcade games. Um, the shiny silver disc business, you know, it's decimated. You've got EA, Activision, you know, um, who are those other guys? Oh yeah, Take-Two, THQ, you know, it's a horrible business. You know, it's it's the film business now. You've got to have 30 million just to even think about a game, build it takes years, and then you got to have another 30 million to launch it. You know, and then you got to hope you have a mega hit. And it's amazing. You see these game industry execs just stand there trembling on Monday morning, waiting for the numbers from Walmart to see did what did the game make it. That's not fun. So you know, rapid iteration of cool little games on the iPhone, the iPad, the web, that's fun. And uh, we built a model for that, took it into Atari, and uh, pretty much all. All of the old shiny silver disc business is washed out, and everything Atari's doing now is all online, mobile, and social. All right. Well, let's. I mean, that's that brings us to kind of the meat of what we're talking about. So you saw. I mean, a lot of people here are doing the gaming business, and even if you aren't building, even if you aren't dedicated to apps and gaming, a lot of companies are now building games into their business model. Oh yeah. So absolutely. let's talk about how. I mean, how do you go about because. Everybody, if everybody here had thirty million dollars to build a game, they wouldn't be here. So yeah, thirty million dollars would be on the beach. You know, yeah. you know. Exactly. So first, I want to—I I just want to get the elephant out of the room. Do you think it's still possible for gaming companies to make it 
in today's ecosphere with Apple running the way that they run the App Store? Oh, of course. I mean, Apple is no, fundamentally, if you break down the business model, Apple is no different or more painful to a game studio than GameStop and Walmart and Target and everybody else have been to the shiny silver disc business. I mean, you, everybody's got to go pay homage to whoever's controlling the distribution pipeline. The good news is Apple isn't as evil as those guys were, you know? And, you know, there's a, there's a funny thing that happens when a monopoly evolves. As bad as they can be, um, you don't have to waste a lot of time and energy um, playing the competition game to see who's going to give you the better deal or who's going to want some special treatment. You've got one place to go to, and their terms are right there. They're transparent. You know what you're going to what it's going to cost you, and that's what you do. The big problem, though, is that um, the game industry, you know, really bifurcated. You had the shiny silver disc guys, the only game, big game company I think that's done a really decent job of conceptualizing and getting the digital models been EA. You know, they've made they've made more strides in it than anybody else. But um, because of their lineage, they knew what they had to do. It's discoverability. It's marketing and getting the word out about your game and social media and really using social media as a marketing platform, not just tweet your friends. The, um, the big problem we see typically in a lot of the game studios and game companies trying to break through is, you know, there's still an echo out there of guys who think that, well, if I just get in the app store, I'll be fine. And, you know, that's, that's insane. That's just suicide. The, um, you really got to think through a holistic marketing plan. And what we were doing at Atari was recognizing we're not going to build anything anymore. The days of building something are gone. As a publisher, we had to transition into the digital space. We had a great library. I opened up the floodgates because when I walked in, Atari was the most copied game company there was. I swear, you get to the end of every Flash uh, tutorial, and the first thing they had you do was build a ripoff of Pong or Asteroids. And um, you know, you, I scoured the web when we were doing the, the transaction, and I found that Atari games were getting something on the order. Atari ripoffs were getting somewhere on the order of you know, 30 to 40 million plays a month. You know, numbers that Zynga would salivate over. But those were spread across thousands and thousands and thousands of blogs and sites that had embedded somebody's little flash version of a, an, an Atari ripoff. So we went out to all those people and I said, look, you can, you know, you can talk to the lawyer. Uh, nobody wants that. I don't even want to mention their name or mention your name to them. Or just build a game for me. Build a game for our network. We're Atari. We kind of know how to distribute an Asteroids game or a Pong game or a Missile Command or a, you know Battles on whatever, reimagine it, make them you know come up with something new. So we brought them all into the fold, and um, because of the benefit for them is exactly what I was talking about a moment ago. We as Atari already had a machine that knew how to market stuff, knew how to talk to the press, could get attention, could get you know Atari puts out a press release that it you know not only got a cold and it gets front page news. So you know that was what was necessary, and a lot of the smaller studios don't recognize or value enough the power that a publisher or somebody in that position, somebody who can bring you an audience, um, makes to the game. Okay, so you, you said a really cool phrase, holistic. It's like to turn the music on. Oh, yeah, Pat, can we do it? Or, or at the, least switch it to a, a porn soundtrack. That'd yeah. be cool. Um, hold, okay, so I want to hear... Te okay, so I've just come out with a game. It's pretty interesting, got a very strong social aspect. Unfortunately, I don't know how to distribute. I'm a developer. I don't know how to get my message out. I want to hear, talk me through. I've just paid Tom Kozik every cent that I own to come up with a no, badass. You, no, you paid me half your equity. Okay. I've given, you half, <laughs> I've given you half the equity in my company. I want to hear a sample holistic marketing plan for a game that we are now coming out with, that you like the concept If you, re kind if of you really paid me the money, then you have no money to go to your own marketing. The recommendation would be, you go talk to Gree. You go talk to another publisher in the space who knows how to move the needle for you, who's always looking for new content. Um, there are a variety of publishing programs from even the majors. You know, EA, EA still has, even though they kind of say they shut it down, they're still taking smaller titles in through the back door, through what is PopCap and others. So there are distribution models out there, um, but unless you've got the bucks or an investor who's willing to spend the bucks, it's it's not worth trying to take on the marketing necessary to get you to profitability. You do should you should spend the marketing to get you to noticeability, which would then be the validation for um, any other publisher who may take it on. The um, you know the Kickstarter model is working really great for that right now. You know. 
I've talked to a number of VCs who are saying now that unless a startup comes to them with some form of validation from a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo or a Rocket Hub, they're looking at that as the biggest endorsement of whether or not you're investable. And uh, that's a good way to also to get a bit of cash in the door to do some, some fundamental marketing. So I kind of wanted to talk about like the big social gaming companies, the Zingas, all those people. Is that going to, are they going to make it? I mean, are they, because I know that they just went through their IPO and they got killed. They got killed. There's a, um, an exodus at the door. There's a, a lot of producers who've worked for me over the years in various positions at Zynga, or were until recently. Um, yeah, the problem, the problem is that um, Mark is, Mark's a genius in, in many, many respects, but like a lot of geniuses, has massive blind spots. You know, anybody... Such who, as? Uh, such as respecting the, um, respecting the audience, respecting the player. There's only so many Skinner rats out there, and there's only so many times you can click for the action of the game to advance the game is simply clicking on the object in the game, and that gets old, and it's already gotten old. Um, the biggest games that they've, uh, they've had were ones where they started to drift away from that. And ironically enough, they went out and blew all that money on Draw Something, which was unique. It had a unique model of play, but five minutes of, of you know, kind of thinking about the strategy of it, you would have recognized it's got no legs. It, it, doesn't, it has already go from where it was. So, you know, you've got to be able to respect that your players aren't stupid, you know, and they're, you, can, they're, you, can, you can be a mark and you can milk, you know, 40-year-old women for, you know, five bucks a month or whatever the, you know, the ARPU is now um, in a lot of their games, but that will burn out, and they didn't have a second act. And that's why the excess is, is going on right now is there is a, a lot of, you know, Fear, deer in the headlights looks in the hall at the halls of Zynga, wondering, what do we do now? Because they kept, you think about it, look at the lineage, you know, Mafia Wars through to Farmville, through to Frontierville, through to Empires and Allies, through, and on and on and on. To, you know, every one of those games was simply a prettier, noisier version of the previous game. And um, it didn't really engage the player. Great monetization. You know, as I used to call Zynga games, statistics with friends. You know, the um, it was great monetization, great you know metrics and modeling, but not a lot of there there when it came to what am I really getting out of playing it? Well, one thing I I remember the other day we were talking about Angry Birds, and you brought up a really interesting talk about that was you know like really successful companies, not only in the gaming space, but you have to really look at to build it in this environment. What you're talking about, like a whole marketing campaign. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. If you're gonna. Well, and, and that's where they did really, really well. They looked at it and said, first they started with story. They didn't start with game mechanic. They started with story. And that that trumps every other strategy that anybody else has come out with in the game business yet. So you start with story, and then you layer on a really good game mechanic. What makes it engaging to play again and again and again? Because if the story's engaging, I don't... I can forgive simplicity of gameplay, which might get a little monotonous. What was your favorite? Uh, I don't mean to disrupt you, but I just want to know the best game story for you um, of any video game that you've ever done. The highest of the game, game I've ever played or I've ever done. Ever played? Um, I think the big high water mark for me was when Bioshock came out. That was a that was a, a, a shift of how story was being unfolded. I mean, you got Silent Hill was another great um, a great uh, water mark. Halo, of course, you know, did, it didn't had done well in that regard, but the um, the way Bioshock um, had a third person perspective to the story that you, that engaged you, uh, as well as your first person your first person perspective in the game, that was a that was a good mark. I mean, I, I know a lot of screenwriters in Hollywood get get jazzed about the way they saw Bioshock play and the way the story worked out in there. Um, but take it back down to casual games. You know, Angry Birds had a story that was laid out, and they took the time to tell you a little story with the opening animatic and. And it was clever and engaged you, you know, and, and they and they did it in a fun way that you actually cared about those damn eggs, you know, all those evil pigs, you know. So and it's playful ways, and you know, Disney's learned how to manipulate our emotions that way for a long, long time, and a lot of good animation studios know how to do that. But to your point, is they recognized right away that if the story is the core, everything in that game is a marketing vehicle. Every bird, every character, every pig, the egg, the sounds, all of those things become vehicles for your marketing. Um, I can go buy an, an, uh, an Angry Birds plushie. The Angry Birds plushies were out there before the game hit the meteoric rise that it did. You, you could get them long, early, early in the life cycle. 
I don't remember getting any cows from Zynga or anything like yeah. that. You know, there, there was nothing. There was nothing engaging about the characters or the, or the elements in the, in the games to, to make me want to want to have those or care. Uh, okay, I want to talk about like moving forward in the gaming industry. Do you think? I mean, is it going to just be? You mentioned before kind of the movie studio model. Do you think it's just going to be one, two giants plus kind of the re everybody else is doing the long tail thing, or? Well, there'll always be the. Um, yeah, they'll always be the big shiny silver disc business or digital business eventually, as the consoles move to that space. The um, and the, and again, the console manufacturers, the big publishers, have got a vested interest to invest some money into a big franchise title. Um, Hollywood pumps out big franchise titles; it does it well, and there there is an economic model. He says that you know Paramount cannot do the independent film like uh, work the words that just came out last week. Right, great film if you haven't seen it. Um, I don't get any plug for that. I just like the movie. The, um, but you know, there's no way that a, a major studio like Paramount's going to do that. So little CBS Films does that, and you know, we'll continue to see that model evolve. But uh, the majors are always going to be around with a, a few tentpole titles. Uh, the real creative work is going to come from the French, just like it does in, in film and television. From the French? From the fringe. From the fringe. I thought you said from the French. I was like, come now. <laughs> All right. Um, so I wanted to like get your top five for people that are, you know, basing their models. I want to also talk about gamification in other businesses. Right. You know, how is that playing an increasing role in startups? How can people harness gamification in digital startups? Because I mean, you saw the stats. Everybody here that's doing a startup is going digital. So. Right. How do you incorporate that the first, in your business model? The first, the first thing to do is drop the word gamification. Never ever use it again. It's, 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 been, it's been horribly abused and uh, has taken on all kinds of meanings it was never meant to be. At the end of the day, it's behavioral psychology. That's all it is. I, I've been a mentor in Founder Institute for three years and then at UCLA they have this thing called LEAP, um, which is a leadership program for, for high school and college students. And you know the worst thing in the world is several thousand high school kids and they see the guy from Atari and, and Yahoo Games and everything else to the table, and they get the sign list, and I had endless stream of young, eager developers, you know, kids who just, you know, had no thumbs left, they'd worn them down on, the, on, their, on their game controller, and asking, well, what should I do for, for game design? I want, I want to design games, I want to produce games. What should I study? And the look of dejection when I would say economics and psychology. But what, what programming language? Economics and psychology. <laughs> Game, game language, programming languages come and go. Platforms come and go. If you don't understand what motivates people and why they do what they do and the incentive or value propositions that go along with those motivations, it doesn't matter. And that's where I would say that the, uh, you know, the statistics with friends model broke because part of psychology is emotional engagement. You know, that's a key piece of it, and uh, you need to have that. Um, so when we talk about applying game mechanics to any other business, this is nothing new. I mean, most of you in here probably aren't old enough to remember a, a company that was around when I was a kid called SNH Green Stamps. It was the very first incentive model, right? Buy this product, you get a bunch of green stamps, and collect the green stamps, then you can cash them in for a prize later. And then, there, let's see, there's a few airlines that have been doing this for years, and it's a, it's a game model, right? And you know, game mechanics come into play in a much higher level. I always like the analogy that, um, that I, I did with a, a couple of uh, psych students from Columbia University where we went and analyzed the traffic at a Starbucks in Manhattan. And the fun thing was, is that you could see every morning the same people who were the regulars. And the regulars would engage the baristas and say, Sam, how you doing? Good to see you. And the barista would say, you regular? Right? And there'd be this line of 20 people who were patiently doing their, you know, you know New Yorker duty and standing there with their glum faces waiting for their turn. And in walks Sam. The, who, who acknowledges the barista, who the barista knows, has his drink ready for him, meanwhile everybody else is still waiting in line. You just played a game. You just took advantage by building a relationship with that barista that got you a reward. You got your drink faster than anybody else. And so you start to look at those kind of game mechanics in any kind of business. What advantage am I giving somebody for being a certain kind of player? What advantage can I get as a player, you know, or as a customer, for, for interacting in a certain way. And you look for all those multiple interaction models. I always love as a, as a high level game mechanic um, uh, parallel is crafts. Not because of the game uh, of gambling. 
or the gaming, gambling aspect of it. But there's six different games going on on that table at any given time. And if you don't know craps, it's worth, it's worth studying from a, a psychology standpoint because it's the same damn table. But yet everybody who comes up to it has their own experience in their head. And they're either, and the thing is, it's, they can ignore everybody else's game at the table. They're playing their own. And even the best social games do this. I can come up and play my own game. My game on United Airlines or American Airlines with their miles is very different than yours because of the amount of time I fly and where I fly and those kind of things. So you look for those parallels in your business and how do you manipulate the psychology of the behavior of that customer and what they're gonna do. Because they're, all, they're, they're always gonna take an action either with you or a competitor. So how do you manipulate that behavior? Who are the kick-ass innovators right now in the gaming space? Who are the people that you look at, like the companies that are coming up right now or that are in operation that you think they're doing it right? They're really kicking ass out there. I think the, um, in the casual mobile space, um, which is the fastest growing space, um, the guys who've been, they've been bought up by EA, Firemint, and PopCap. Um, like the Peggle guy? PopCap's uh, Peggle, right? And Bejeweled, and Chuzzle, and all that stuff. Very simplistic puzzle games. Roughly, I think the last numbers I saw were estimates around two <coughs> to 300 million minutes of gameplay a month. That's the GDP of most European nations, okay? If you look at the productivity time, it's amazing the amount of time sunk into these games. And it, where, where is it sunk? At the bus stop, you know, in a meeting that's really boring. You know, it's, it's, it's not time that was productive anywhere else. So, you know, when you see these articles like, oh, the horrors of games, we're losing all this productivity. No, it was a waste of time anyway, pretty much. There's very few people who seriously leave the real world and waste their time in the game. Some do. There's 12-step programs for them. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's a different point. But um, you know, getting you know, getting through to those people, and there's reasons that, that break down those games and understand why is somebody engaged in that game? What are they getting out of it? What's the reward? What's the communication? The messaging back and forth. Firemint did a great job again um, with story, right? You know, the um, uh, the team at Rovio. We'll see. Do they have a second act? I, I, that's actually a really interesting question. Do you think they do? I mean, Angry, I love I think, Angry Birds Space. But I think they. I think they do. Um, I think they will. The the good news is that they don't have to. They're in no rush. I mean, they, <coughs> they've got a printing press that's just churning out money um, with Angry Birds right now. Still, they can afford to to polish it up. They are. I, I say Rovio is the Pixar right now of the social gaming space. They can afford to take their time, do it right, and it's a gem. You know. I have kind of a. I, I don't know. It's a question because I mean we always hear the word social games, but social games. Do you think that there will be a world where there's actually games that involve real cooperation on a social level to make them succeed? Because right now you see Call of Duty, and yeah, you could be like the. Right. the it's, they're, they exist. Trivial, per, Trivial Pursuit, charades. They've existed for a long time. You know my adage. I mean, every game is social, other than other than um, tic tac. Uh, not even tic tac toe is social. Other than a crossword puzzle, or a Sudoku, every game is social. Chess, two guys sitting in a park over a table, that's a social game. Um, what made games social in our mind, in, in, in the modern use of the term, was when suddenly I could see my friends. And, and a fun story, and, and you, you've heard it before, but um, you know, many of you probably have been in that situation where you beat your head against the wall going, why didn't they see what we had? Right? You, know, you had this great idea, and the company you were working at just didn't get it. And so you had to go out and do a startup or you had to break free and do something. So it's uh, 2003 at Yahoo. And Yahoo Messenger has just gotten redressed. And the Messenger team comes along and says, we're going to put tabs at the bottom of the Messenger window. And in the, each tab, we're going to give each working group in Yahoo, uh, or each major uh, working group in Yahoo, it, their own tab. There's going to be a news tab. There's going to be a finance tab. There's going to be a sports tab, a weather tab. We'll give them a games tab. And of course, it's you know, pretty obvious what goes in the news tab. Well, what news headlines you wanted. You know, give me your zip code and I'll give you the news. Or give me your zip code and I'll give you the weather. And so very personalized content in that little tab. They came to the games team and said, well, what are you gonna put in there that's personalized? We thought, oh. Um, we've got these 36 really bad circa 1997 interface Java games like poker, um, uh, Wordorama, you know. Um, you know, very simple little, you know, tic-tac-toe puzzle-ish games that were, you know, the dregs of the Yahoo gaming experience. But they were multiplayer, and you would play with someone else on Yahoo. 
We wired that into Messenger instantly, literally overnight. Those games became the highest trafficked pages on Yahoo because one thing happened that we didn't understand was going to happen. You self-selected, before there was a Friendster, before there was a MySpace, before there was any of this stuff, you self-selected your social network. You do it in AIM, you do it in Messenger. Who do I want to, think about Messenger in the early days or AIM. Yeah, yeah. You put the people you wanted to talk to, right? So that was your self-selected social network. And what we did is, you know, we said, great, in the tab, in that little tab at the bottom, where do you score on this particular game? And where does that rank against your friends? Gameplay went through the roof. Because now suddenly somebody said, well, wow, Sam's better than me? I gotta go kick his ass. And um, it, uh, it illustrated this, this selective competitive, you know, leaderboards, every game has leaderboards. You go to your airline website, you type in your frequent flyer number, and up in the corner you've got a points model. That's a leaderboard. The leaderboards exist everywhere, right? The national debt clock on 6th Avenue in New York, leaderboards everywhere. Um, so, you know, but the thing is, is again, like, like the craps analogy, everybody can look at a leaderboard differently. And what we saw here was that people would look at the leaderboard and say, oh, wait a minute, I'm, Sam's better than me in this game, or I'm better than somebody else in this other game. And that suddenly drove all this gameplay. These guys at Facebook got that. Nobody at Yahoo did, you know? And so the, the, the network that uh, established taking that social graph and connecting it around gameplay exploded there. And that's what Zynga was in the early position to take advantage of. Companies like Yahoo just didn't get that. So, um, how that answers your question, I don't know, but it was a fun story. It did, and speaking of answering questions, I was just looking at the clock. What I'd like to do right now is, first of all, big round of applause for that. But I know you're all sitting here and you need to ask the questions. What I want to do for the last 20 minutes is just open it up for the room, have you guys, you know, Ask Tom anything you want to do. This is like the most important part of Startup Grind is now is the time where you guys have access to amazing, amazing professionals to find out how these lessons apply to your business. So I'll just walk around with Mike who, who's got stuff that they want to ask. All right. Do you mind if I get out of the comfy chair and stand No, no, no. Down? Get up, go, do whatever you got to do. Oh, no. Pass out, fall asleep then. Normally I get asked the question, so I was like, ah. Oh. But um, my question is, do you think it's like say, like you said, it's everyone cares like if you get like into like Launchpad LA or if you get into one of these, one of these um like launch pads or something. So, and those guys are raising like fifty grand. So like say you, you right. get into Launchpad, you get fifty thousand. So say for example, like we bypassed and got five hundred thousand for our startup. Do you think later on to get more VCs that'll be more like is that as acceptable as getting that fifty thousand from a launch pad compared to getting five hundred from it, it's a great question because I think what's happening right now and I know like, you know, uh, I got a number of friends who are at the various, you know, incubators here in town, Amplify and a bunch of them up in the Bay Area and I've I've got, you know, two startups I've invested in that have come up with that that model as well. The um, I think we're gonna get burned out, you know. I Easily two years ago, certainly still last year. This year, we'll see. Next year, the year after, I don't know. It was that if you came through one of those incubation models, you know, um, you know, it seems like TechCrunch loves Y Combinator, and that's about you know, and, and they you know will will sing glowing praises about every Y Combinator company. But there's so many of these now. There, you know, there's how's there going to be enough press to cover you and and you know, take you up and lift you up because they're all still promising. A lot of these incubation or, or launchpad style programs. Are promising. Well, you're going to get all this press. The press is kind of getting burnt out on these, and it's you know it's not going to have the same value in another year that it had last year. So um, you know it comes back down to what's going to be the next new trend that's going to help you get so could you break up press. David and Goliath sort of like we didn't get fifty thousand from a launch pad, but we got half a million from. Would that be like. A little bit more serious, you think? Well, it, you know, it, yeah, it can it can get you a little more news. I think uh, again, I think repeating something I said earlier, the most interesting trend I'm seeing right now is how many VCs, traditional VCs, and and of course the angels as well. Angels are um, a lovely bunch. I've raised a lot of money with angels, and I'm an angel myself. But um, God, it's you know the the you know it's it's per, the personal attitude that comes in versus the professional attitude. It, they're both devils to dance with. Um, but the, the VCs now are so much looking at what validation did you get? Did you run a Kickstarter? Did you go on Indiegogo? Did you have something to offer the customer? Who bit? 
because they recognize if somebody's willing to put up their money, even if it's a dollar, even if it's five dollars, that is a validation of you and your business model. Um, there's a number of game companies, uh, two of which I'm on the board of, fully funded their game on, on Kickstarter. And I think that's going to get tougher and tougher because the bar of the quality of the game out there on Kickstarter or any of the other platforms is going up and up. But um, it's, uh, it's interesting that right now there's this temperature out there in the investment community that they're expecting that validation from a, a crowdsourcing, crowdfunding platform to say, yep, there's enough people out here interested and have voted for your game. It's more valid than you know, the survey you would have done on SurveyMonkey you know, two years ago and come back and say, well, 10,000 people said they'd really like us if we did this game. No, I got 500 people who said they'd plunk down real money tomorrow if the game was launched. The 500 win. All right, who's up next? Were there any other questions in the audience right now? There was like four hands that I missed. Earlier. There you go. Uh, so you talked a little bit about like leaderboards, uh, people thinking competitively. Uh, so I obviously get it in gaming, and you talked a little bit like the airlines. Do you see other industries doing that well and thinking, how can I beat out my competition or make something a little more interesting by adding right. this in? Yeah, it don't always think in competition, right? There's a great iPad app. If you haven't seen it, go get it. It's called Unstuck. It is absolutely the best brainstorming app ever invented, I think, for a device like this. And um, very cool UI, good tool to walk you through conceptualization. And at the end of it, what they tell you is, okay, the way you describe the problem you're having that you're stuck on and the, and the, and the, uh, the nature of the, the challenges you're facing, here's how you map against the rest of the people who've ever taken this, who've ever used the same tool. So it's not competitive, <coughs> because if you think about, if you, if you Get away from um, gaming for a second. You think about, oh, I have a problem that I want a solution for. You never want to feel alone in your problem, right? You want to know that other people have the same problem. It's why we watch Jerry Springer, because we want to know that somebody's got it worse than us. <laughs> so, you know, a leaderboard can reflect a, uh, a competitive score. It can reflect a collaborative score. It can reflect um, my relevance to the community at large. It can reflect the level of interest. There's any number of types of data um, that you can reflect it. A good friend of mine, Peter Hirschberger, um, look him up on some of the best TED Talks ever. Uh, used to be at Apple and uh, a bunch of agencies. And um, he's got this great phrase that I, I absolutely love. Data is the new oil. And you know, the more you can come up with different ways to present the data, instrument everything. You know, I, I, I tell a lot of companies I'm working with, that you know, it's not about just putting Google Analytics on a few pages anymore. You analyze everything on that page. And as a database guy from my youth, it's not what they clicked on, it's the absence of what they clicked on that's most important. What did they ignore? What didn't get done? What path didn't they go down? And um, you know, you'll never, you can't instrument anything enough. And you know, you'll, you'll spit out reams of garbage data, don't get distracted, it's, you know, it's grist for the mill later, but that data can present incredible perspectives and pictures of what's going on in your community. What does your community care about? What do they do? Where do they go? Um, you know, I would love to know, and I haven't seen it in any of the airline sites, for example. Um, I've seen it a couple ancillary sites who collect data in a different way. Great, where do most people use their frequent flyer miles for? Is it a family vacation? Do they go on the long trips? Do they go on short trips? You know, is it relevant to me? It may be relevant on a Travelocity. It may be relevant on a, on a, a kayak or a, a hip monk. But there's, there's all kinds of ways to take that data and express it in a in variety of fashions. There's no one answer because not everybody in your audience is motivated by the same things. Hi. I'm David. Hi, David. Um, so I was wondering what you think about the idea of uh, circumventing a payment model, because everything has a payment model right now, right? Or a support model mm -hmm. in, uh, in game companies. Yeah. Um, and you talked about benefits of building a relationship with a barista at Starbucks. I was thinking of taking that to the next level and that being the only transaction model between the player and the game company. Do you think something like that could work monetarily? Right, so using a, a personal relationship model instead of a, a credit card based transactional model to, to build engagement. I imagine somewhere behind that there's a, there's a, there is a revenue model that keeps you employed and pays your rent. Um, I'm not going to ask you to divulge that here, but yeah, I mean, that is, everything about our, our, our modern culture right now is shifting. It's kind of cool, it's, we're in an amazing age right now, you know. 
I, um, I used to be really paranoid about getting this old. You know, I thought, God, I turned 40 and that's it, I'm just going to kill myself. And um, uh, I got to 50 and I realized, too late, um, I'm, close, I'm close enough to Social Security, I might as well hang around and see if it lasts. But the, um, but the cool thing is, is you know, having watched like, what's happened, it's, it's, it, it, this, there's this, you know, screw, I got friends who, whose parents, you know, were hippies in the 60s and marching in the streets, like, you got, you were so wrong. You know, this is the, you know, the age of Chris. Whether it's the economic, mo the, econ the world economic crises, multiple and still more to come, that have shifted us, we're, think we're shifting our thinking, and everything's becoming more and more about the personal relationship than it ever was before. And ways to um, make that the, the payment of the transaction, how much did I interact, what was the quality of my interaction, that's going to pay off massive dividends for the companies that get it. You see clothing companies doing that a little bit. Um, I would say a example is um, Zappos, uh, Warby Parker. Zappos is stock and trade is the relationship they build with you. You know their prices aren't that much better. Their prices, in some cases, are worse. But you don't care because look at the relationship they build with me. They cared about me. They'll do anything for me. They'll spend. My girlfriend, they spent an hour and a half on the phone with her, just chit-chatting about the weather in Vegas and where she used to live and everything else, when she called to return a pair of shoes. And she now will, you know, nobody will ever buy anything off of anywhere except Zappos because they like me. You know, and that's, that's massively powerful in terms of building a customer, customer relationship and locking them in. It used to be about locking people in because they were economically too far into you, they couldn't afford to get out, you know, the, the equivalent of too big to fail. I can't afford to leave, I've got too much invested in you. The airlines, I can't afford to fly anybody else, I'm just 5,000 miles short. So um, now we're getting into that, that I can't afford to leave because you know me, you like me, I know about you. And that's gonna be massively powerful in a lot more models. Um, thanks, um, hi, Eugene. Um, you you're a startup company. You're um, got a unique idea, at least you think you have a unique idea, you've done your research, and you're finding there's some other players out there similar to you, but not exactly the same. You want to get out there and raise some money. Right. Is it more important to be the first out? And, and my second part of my question is, what do the angels and the VCs look at in, in respect to your business as, as to, are you the first out, or are you the one with the most Unique. Unique right. or... It's, it's a fantastic set of questions in there, and we could spend another three hours on that one, but <laughs> try to boil it down in a nutshell. Um, one, you're never going to be first. I don't care how smart you are, there is someone else somewhere thinking of the same thing or has already tried the same thing and shown to someone else. doesn't matter. We are, for all of our, 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 our egos as entrepreneurs, we like to believe we're the first ones. We're usually not. You know, it's, and it's, there's no shame in that, you know. There's that old um, anthropological study about the 100 monkeys, right? 100 monkeys on one island start washing their, their coconuts in, in, the, in the ocean water, the stream water, and for some strange reason, with no communication, the monkeys on the next island start doing it too, but it happens when they hit about 100 monkeys on the first island, right? Why did that happen? It just happens. You know, great ideas suddenly somehow all spring into existence right around the same time. You're never gonna be first. Um, if you have a VC, or an investor, it's, it's, and this is the knife's edge as, a, as an entrepreneur, right? You need the money, you got you got bills to pay. Um, and this guy says he's gonna give you money and he wants you to be the first, or, or defensible, or you know have unassailable patents. Go find another VC, because that person's gonna be nothing but problems for you down the road because they don't know the real value of what you're trying to do, okay? If they're totally focused on you having some purity of, of defensibility, or being the only one in your category, they're the wrong investor, okay? As much as you need that money. Um, and it's hard, because I've, I've been there a dozen times. And I'm lucky, I've, I've, been, I've had situations where I have got unassailable patents or technology. Doesn't matter. None of it matters except the market. You need two things. You need to be able to show that there is a market. You could have the best technology. You could have the best team. All this, all this, these, you know, entrepreneurial, um, you know, hints and tips and courses and shit that tell you that, you know, oh, it's all about the team. Bullshit. Or it tell you it's all about having patents. Bullshit. It's about is there a market? Because without a market, none of those other things matter. So, um, and then once you have a market, then you got to look at how good am I engaging the emotions 
of that market, right? Um, I'm right now, I told Sam on the way in, um, I'm, I've just taken on the CEO role, if any of you know about the X Prize, uh, which is, you know, Richard Branson's space exploration and, uh, you know, Elon Musk sending, you know, stuff up now to the International Space Station, the Qualcomm tricorder medical device X Prize and the self-driving car that Google uses for Street View, all these X Prizes, 10, 20, 30 million dollar prizes to, to change humanity, right? Five to eight year time frames. Um, Peter Diamantis, brilliant guy, also started Singularity University, also started SpaceX, started Planetary Resources, because he's gonna go mine asteroids in our lifetime. Um, yeah, I get to work with these people. Uh, he decided we need a Kickstarter version of XPRIZE. How do we get the masses to do this? Because we're never gonna move fast enough or large enough at 10, 20, 30 million dollar prizes taking five to eight years. How do we do it at half a million in, in 12 to 18 months? So um, about a month ago I just took that role on, so I'm still juggling three different boards and two companies and now doing this. Um, if anybody knows a good cloner, uh, cloner. but um, you know this idea of uh, engagement, right? There's a dozen, a dozen people I found, companies in this space that are doing incentivized competition. Innovation through competition with prizes. None of them speak to your soul. Why am I going to bother trying to change the world unless I really care? All of them are, all of them are, some of them have got brilliant user experiences, beautiful UIs for project management software. So when you get to the value of what is it your market is there, why does your market exist? In this case, we're looking at the market, we're realizing the market exists because they want to be inspired. They want to be emotionally involved. They want to feel that they're part of the contribution. They don't care that you've got the best communication, you've got the best social sharing feature over your competitor. They don't care that your Gantt charts are better than the other guy. That's a, so what? So the smart money, there, there, are, there is a lot of smart money out there, is gonna look at how well do you know your market and what are you doing to appeal to their core? Because if you do that in any product, and I've done this and I've, I've seen the best companies do it, I've had, been lucky enough to do it a couple of times. If you appeal to that core of what your audience's values are, anybody else who comes out with what the, some, some investor thinks, oh wait, they're a competitor, or what is Microsoft gonna do or Google gonna do? More likely than not, they don't have that same understanding of that core value of what your customer wants. And no matter what they do, they're not gonna catch you, right? You may, not be the first, you may not be the market leader, look at Apple versus Microsoft for decades, right? But you have a loyal base that is never going to leave you, and you can build on that. So um, find a way to, to really understand your market, build that value, and that value will get expressed if you've got good you know, interface people and everything else. That value will get expressed in your product, and then you can look at any other product that looks like a competitor, and the reality is, if they don't really get that audience, and deliver that value, they will die. Thank you. Uh, Keith? Thank you very much, Tom. Oh. So, you bootstrap, you, uh, your, your, your startup, early startup, and you decided that you're gonna go out there, and you start getting some traction. Now, what kind of leverage do you have? Um, depends, again, on the nature of the traction, right? It's if your traction is distribution, if you're your traction some, is revenue flow. Yeah, you're getting some traction from your market. Right. And it's starting. If you, if you have revenue flow, you've got deal flow, you've got consumer signups, if it's a free, a freemium offer initially. Um, if you can show that the functional model, and this goes above what I was talking about with the market and you know, really getting to that emotional core of what, why does the market care about what you're doing or what you're providing for them. As long as you got that, everything else above it's kind of mechanical. Then you've got to be able to prove the mechanics work, that the machine isn't going to break, that this machine can scale. And there are a lot of uh, investors out there, particularly like in the Tech Coast Angels here in town, a lot of smart guys in the Tech Coast Angels, and a lot of hangers on. There's a lot of very wealthy guys who kind of sit there in the room and listen to what he says, because he's the smart one. Um, it's the glasses. Uh, I didn't mean Sam literally, but you know, they, they, listen, they, listen, to, they listen to the other guy. And, um, so uh, there are a lot of smart guys here in LA, there's a lot of smart guys up in the valley who will look at these things and if you can show that you've started to the machine working and you can you can show mechanically in an Excel spreadsheet that that machine can scale within reason without you know your costs are contained and you know you're 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 able to survive a hit to the economy, a hit from a major competitor, you know, entering the market and getting a lot of attention. I'm never worried about a mar I'm never worried about a competitor stealing my customers. Very rarely happens in any business, and not just talking about my companies, anything. I'm more worried about a competitor stealing the limelight 
because now they've introduced the, the, an issue either into the press or the consumer's mind going, huh, which one? So as long as your model can survive that, it, there are plenty of VCs who, who will acknowledge that and recognize it.